virgin most powerful radio sharing the gospel with clarity and charity and now virgin most powerful radio is pleased to present hands-on apologetics with renowned catholic author and apologist gary machuda Welcome, everyone. It's good to be back. Yes, you are listening to Hands-On Apologetics, Virgin Most Powerful Radio Apologetics Dojo. I'm Gary Machuda, your host and sensei, I guess you could call me. And we're looking at how to explain, defend the faith with clarity, charity, and with confidence. And we need confidence in you know, showing Christ to the world, explaining Christ to the world, clearing up misunderstandings and so on. And uh, and uh, we got a huge week ahead of us and a, a great show in store for us today. Actually, you know, before I forget, tomorrow I will not be in live. We will have a very best of hands-on apologetics. I'm going to be doing a uh, speaking engagement here in the Detroit area. Uh, Wednesday, Master Apologist Carlo Brassard returns back to the dojo. And uh, we're going to be talking about suffering and the meaning of suffering. Uh, Thursday, we're going to change things up a little bit. And uh, we're going to invite uh, Mathema on the show. Now, that might sound like uh, something from uh, Johnny Sacco or or, uh, Godzilla versus Rodan or something like that. But no, Mathema has a uh, video channel that's pretty popular on YouTube. And uh, he defends classical theism. He does a really outstanding job. So we're going to have him on the show and kind of go through uh, some common mistakes that uh, you find out on the web that inhibit inhibit people from embracing the existence of God. Finally, on Friday, we're going to have Dr. Brian Bradford. He's going to return to the JoJo. Uh, if you remember, uh, Dr. Bradford's specialty is Islam. And uh, he uh, he's going to talk to us about Jesus and the Quran. Uh, and that's kind of interesting because, uh, you know, does the Quran speak about Jesus? Who is Jesus as portrayed in the Quran? Lots of fun stuff. Um, but let's talk about today's show, shall we? Because uh, we really kick off the week with some great uh, information. In fact, today we're going to talk about a topic that is... Uh, very difficult for non-Catholics to believe, especially Protestants, and that is purgatory. You know, it is the Lenten season, time for fasting, prayer, sanctification, focusing on the things of not this world, but of the next. And we're going to have a uh, former evangelical, uh, revert, longtime friend of mine, Stephen Peskarowski, come to the show. He's going to share with us his thoughts on purgatory, how he came to embrace that doctrine as an evangelical. But before we bring uh, Stephen to the mic, we have a few exercises that we do every day here on Hands-On Apologetics. We've got Defining the Fallacy and also Meet the Early Church Father. Uh, Finding the Fallacy for today. Today's fallacy is the Inflation of Conflict Fallacy. This is something we find a lot. You know, it's, it's not really something reasoned, but I think it's a way which people who... Uh, don't really give much thought to things kind of think. I, I don't know how to describe it better than that. But let's explain what is the fallacy. The fallacy is uh, uh, when uh, be- when you reason that because authorities don't agree precisely on an issue, that their inability to come to a single conclusion shows that there really is no conclusion at all. Uh, so, so this is very popular with people who like to think in terms of black and white. You know, so if everybody is in agreement on a particular thing, then there is no agreement and there is no truth in that matter. And uh, we find this a lot today. Uh, for example, I think when most people think of philosophy, and uh, most rank and file, not the, the people here, you know, the regular listeners and things like that. When we think of philosophy, we think of, uh, you know, there doesn't seem to be much consensus in philosophy among philosophers and different people have different views. And it's easy just to dismiss the whole enterprise of philosophy. And uh, because there there doesn't seem to be substantial agreement. 
And this is the fallacy of the inflation of conflict, where basically either you know exactly what the truth is or nothing can be known at all. Okay, so it could also be a false dichotomy as well. Also, uh, let's see, before we go, I just realized that I forgot to give my shout outs for today. Shame on me. Uh, <laughs> before, uh, as always, you are part of the program. And, uh, you know, uh, please give us a call, if you, especially if you want to talk to Stephen Piskorowski about purgatory. Give us a call at 888 526 2151. That's 888-526-2151. If you want to send email questions, uh, we'd love to hear from you at questions at handsonapologetics.com. That goes straight to the dojo. So if you have any, any questions for me, that is the way to get a hold of me. And also, shout out to those watching live stream on Facebook and YouTube. Hi, everybody. I'm sorry for my negligence. Usually I get to you before we start doing the heavy intellectual lifting, but it's good to see familiar names. Actually, a couple new names, too. Welcome aboard, everyone. And uh, by the way, you can watch this live stream on Facebook or YouTube. Or uh, if you aren't available during this time of day, but you'd like to hear maybe a past program, you can always go to www.virginmostpowerfulradio.org. That is the, head, the world headquarters website. And you can access not only hands-on apologetics, but all the great shows. And we do have some really fantastic shows from Virgin Most Powerful. So check it out. Check it out, folks. Okay, so I'm sorry for that uh, really odd segue there. But let's finish, uh, let's finish talking about meeting the early church fathers every episode. I want to introduce you to an early church father. And today, and some of them are very well known. Some of them are a bit obscure. This particular early church father is a little bit obscure. It is St. Germain I of Constantinople. He was born sometime around AD 634, died AD 733. Uh, Germain, or sometimes it's, it's spelled German, uh, is the first name of the would-be, uh, or excuse me, the first name of the Patriarch of Constantinople. He, like I said, he was born around 634. His father was a nobleman named Justinian and was a confidant of the emperor Heraclitus, who lived from 610 to 641. Justinian gradually lost favor, however, and later emperors, uh, roughly around 668, charged him with treasonable conspiracy and executed him. Germain uh, also... Uh, <laughs> Received a blow, I guess you could say. Germain was castrated and obliged to join the clergy at the Church of the Hagia Sophia, the Holy Wisdom. But uh, interesting enough, when you think that that would be a low point in St. Germain's life, it's actually his fortunes and influence increased when he joined the religious order. And uh, it was able to persuade the emperor, Constantine IV, uh, Pogonatus, to uh, convoke the Third Council of Constantinople, which, by the way, is the Sixth Ecumenical Council. And this council met together to condemn a heresy that was uh, pretty rife in the church here in the 7th century, known as monothelism. Well, we've spoken about that in earlier programs. Monothelism is a heresy where uh, they believe that Jesus Christ only has one will. Okay, the divine will. He didn't have a truly human will. And the problem with that heresy, if you want the Cliff Notes version, is that if Christ only had a divine will, then he wasn't truly or fully human. Because to be human, you need a human will. And the orthodox and correct understanding is that uh, Christ has both a divine will and a human will, but they both work in concert with one another. They're never opposed to one another. So, uh, the uh, Third Council of Constantinople, Sixth Ecumenical Council, met in 681 to condemn that heresy. Um, <clears throat> around the year 706, Germain was made archbishop. Um, he was, uh, there was also accusations made under the pressure of the, em the new emperor uh, against him. And at the synod in uh, 8712, something was strange happens. Uh, St. Germain actually subscribes, uh, apparently, to the monothelism, to the heresy that he fought against all those years. Now, we're, it's very odd that he would do such a, a you know, turn coat, so to speak, at this council. 
<clears throat> perhaps it's human weakness. Perhaps it is uh, something in history that we're missing some sort of fact. But if it is true, it's hard to understand because almost immediately afterwards, he affirms Christ's two nature and wills in August the 715. And he was made uh, the part patriarch of Constantinople by the Orthodox Emperor Athanasius II. Uh, um, <clears throat> he immediately convoked a synod in 715 and once again formally condemned monothelism. So, you know, he may have had a moment of weakness in his life, or perhaps, like I said, maybe it's a fact of history we just don't know about. <clears throat> but there is that odd zigzag <laughs> in his trajectory. Another thing that Germain is, St. Germain is well known for is he was an ardent opponent of iconoclasm which is another heresy that uh, religious images shouldn't be used. Uh, in other words, it's against Im images such as statues and pictures and so on. And this was done under uh, Emperor Leo III, uh, who was very influenced by Islam. Germain, you know, stood his ground and was an ardent opponent of uh, iconoclasm, that we can use icon statues and pictures you know, because not that we worship them, but they raise our minds to the things that are imaged. Uh, he eventually was retired uh, just outside of Constantinople and died in 733 AD at the ripe old age of 98. So <laughs> this is one of those later early church fathers, but very important one, St. Germain I of Constantinople. St. Germain, please pray for us. And uh, that's our Meet the Early Church Father for today. On the other side of the break, we're going to talk about purgatory with former evangelical Stephen Piskorowski. You don't want to miss it. It'll be, uh, I'm sure, going to be a great conversation. Stay tuned. This is Terry Barber inviting you, all the men, to a men's conference June 15th at the Sacred Heart Chapel. This is going to be a day where we're going to talk about true masculinity. You know, there's a problem in the Catholic Church today. We have very few men who love the Catholic faith. And I know a lot of the wives that I'm listening to right now are saying, I want my husband to be on fire for the faith. Send him to the men's conference. Your son, send him to the men's conference by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org or call 877-526-2151. That's June 15th. When your husband comes back from this conference or your son, they're going to have a different view about their Catholic faith because they're going to meet three men who love Jesus and his bride, the church, and are going to instill in them a love for Christ and his church, the Eucharist, Our Lady. Bring them to virginmostpowerfulradio.org. Sign up there or call 877-526-2151. Full sheen ahead. It is only because of your continued prayers and generous donations that Virgin Most Powerful Radio can broadcast live each weekday. We count on your spiritual and financial support because you understand the urgent need for Catholic programming that shares the gospel with clarity and charity, but without compromise. Please prayerfully consider becoming a monthly donor. You can set it up with the touch of a button on our website, catholicrc.org. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US1. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 
888-253-2151. Here's Gary. And hey, welcome back, everybody. Hands-on apologetics. We're going to be talking about purgatory. You know, purgatory is uh, one of those topics that many non-Catholics have difficult understanding. Is it, uh, is it a Catholic version of getting a second chance to, in getting into heaven? Is it uh, uh, some sort of work, you know, that we didn't work hard enough here on earth, so we have to, you know, work it off in purgatory? Uh, uh, is it uh, some people think that maybe, uh, you know, God is mean and stingy and, you know, we had too much fun on earth and this is where we we get our comeuppance, you know, all sorts of distorted ideas. Well, to help us work through uh, purgatory is my next guest, a longtime friend, uh, reaver to the Catholic faith, Stephen Piskorowski. Um, Stephen was born and baptized in the Catholic Church. He left at the age of 23 to... Uh, become an evangelical protestant and uh, eventually he worked his way you know through study and prayer back to the catholic church and now he's an outstanding uh, catholic apologist in his own right uh stephen piskorowski welcome to hands-on apologetics gary thank you for having me back on i'm pleased to be here yeah uh you know i always ask my guests to, to maybe give like a, a short uh, five minute ten minute summary of your journey to the faith uh Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, uh, I had uh, I had been born and raised in the Catholic Church as a youngster, and uh, was I would consider myself nominal. You know, attended Mass on Sundays with my parents, and I had a spiritual awakening uh, in my early twenties, and I decided that I was going to get serious about God and and want to live for Him, and I started to read the Bible, and I went back to my Catholic priest at my church, and I had some questions for him about what the church teaches and why. And I, I, I unfortunately didn't get the type of answers that I was hoping to get. And ultimately, I just decided, well, all churches are the same after all. So why don't I just go, go church shopping and see what else is out there? See, I really didn't understand the differences in theology. Uh, and um, I left the Catholic Church, became an evangelical Christian. And um, it was later on, through trying to officially disprove the Catholic Church, that I actually ended up reverting back to the Catholic Church uh, because of my studies. Um, so it, it's, it was a quite a long journey, and um, I'm just glad to be back home in the Catholic Church. And one of the, one of the biggest areas that was a stumbling block for me uh, in returning to the Church was really understanding the doctrine of purgatory. I had a real problem with that and and i'm glad that um i'm glad that we're talking about that today because that doctrine is very near and dear to my heart because i went through a a lot of emotional upheaval trying to understand it and embrace it uh, as i was coming back into the catholic church right yeah let you know let's dwell a little bit about that because i know for many cradle catholics that might seem odd because it's just part of you know the religious air we breathe you know purgatory and sanctification all that uh, why is purgatory such a, a difficulty for uh, non-catholic protestants the, i think the reason and i just use me as an example gary for me trying to understand purgatory as an evangelical it really doesn't have a place in evangelical protestantism theology hmm. so for instance uh, we can all agree that jesus is god we can all agree that uh, his mother is uh, he was born of a virgin. Uh, we can all, there's a number of things in Christian theology we can all agree on. But purgatory has to do with the way we receive our final rush of sanctification. And in Protestant theology, that's never really looked at very closely. Hmm. Uh, it's something that we more or less don't even talk about. I mean, at least I didn't when I was a Protestant. I just assumed, well, you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior with a sincere heart, and at that point you are saved. Anything else after that would be either considered additional extra credit stuff, or it could be um, adding, you know, worst case scenario, adding to the finished worth of work of Christ on the cross. So to me as, a, as an evangelical Protestant, I saw purgatory as, at worst, an addition, you know, Jesus didn't accomplish everything on the cross for us. There's still stuff that I had to do. Right. Um, or, 
you know, at, at best, it was just something that just wasn't discussed very often. Yeah. Um, yes. It, it, Go on. Yeah, and it has to do with the way that we find we receive the final rush of our sanctification. And in, in Protestant theology, there's no place for that. So I viewed purgatory as an addition to the finished work of Christ, and that's a contradiction. So right. that's why I had a real problem with it. I think a lot of people have a problem with it today as well. I actually came up with, I went back to my, own, uh, my old notes um, <laughs> when I was investigating this, and I had 11 objections to the doctrine of purgatory. Really? And that was, that was one of the top ones, uh, adding to the finished work of Christ. Yeah. That's what I believed at that time. Well, uh, do, you, do you have them in front of you? I'd love to hear what the 11 are. Well, I could rattle them off real quick, and then maybe we can, we can chew on a few of them if you like. Okay. The, first one was, yeah. the first one was Catholics add to the finished work of Christ on the cross. They supplement Jesus' sacrifice on the cross with this doctrine of a final purging and purgatory because Jesus' sacrifice wasn't enough. Okay. The second one was, since we're saved by faith alone, there is no need for purgatory. Okay. Uh, the third one is, not only uh, is purgatory unscriptural, but also unnecessary, because we are cleansed in the blood of Christ by accepting Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. Okay, well, My why fourth don't we, objection... Uh, well, hold on, Steve, why don't we, uh, I can keep going why don't we take care of those three? Yeah, and, uh, and then we could go on. That would be fun. Uh, okay, so sure. how, would, uh, how would you answer your own first objection that uh, purgatory is an, somehow in addition to the finished work of Christ, and therefore it, it's almost a blaspheme to, to uh, insist that something else is needed besides what Jesus did. Yeah, it's just like if you try and put a square peg into a round hole, it doesn't fit, and everybody standing around the table notices that. Yeah. Right? So the way I saw it is purgatory doesn't fit in Protestant uh, theology because of the view of how we're saved in Protestant theology. In Catholic theology, we believe that the, the person actually will, the soul of the person will become perfect, whether in this world or in the next, prior to entering into heaven. In Protestant theology, the understanding, at least the way I understood it, was that the soul doesn't necessarily go, undergo a change in, to become perfect. It's, in a sense, covered with the righteousness of Christ. Okay. Luther had an example of this um, in, in Germany, uh, you know, with, with, the, uh, with the dunghills of the animals. When the, when the, when the snow would, would come down and cover the dunghill, the dunghill still was dung, but it was clothed in the righteous or the whiteness of the snow. And he used that example in terms of the soul, that the soul was still imperfect, stays imperfect, even after death, but it is clothed with the righteousness of Christ, and it's on that basis that we would enter into heaven. Catholics look at it differently. We would say that that dung is actually transformed and purged into perfection. So something actually happens to the soul, uh, either in this world or in the next, because after all, the scriptures clearly teach that no unclean thing can enter into the kingdom of God. So God actually purges us and makes us per per perfect so we can be with him where he is. So purgatory in Catholic theology is a must. Uh, purgatory in Protestant theology has no place, and I think that's where we lose a lot in the transition. Uh, and having a conversation about these two things. It's almost like talking about apples and oranges. Right, right. Yeah, very good. And, of course, you know, uh, it seems like when you were recounting, you know, your own view as a evangel former evangelical, that, uh, you know, justification is the, the main focus. Sanctification, yeah, you wouldn't deny that you need to be sanctified, but it really doesn't, uh, it isn't systematized in such a way that uh, you see the importance of sanctification. Yeah, I actually had a, a very good friend of mine, and we he's still an evangelical, and we have these type of discussions. And this topic came up a couple weeks ago, and uh, and I said, Brother, you know, when you, when you die, do you believe that you will be perfect entering into heaven? Your soul will be in a state of perfection with no stains or anything of that nature. He said, Oh, yeah. 
And I said, good, so do I. I said, do you believe that this can take place either before or after your death, this, this, uh, this perfection, whatever you want to call it? And he said, absolutely. And I said, well, let's just talk about what if the perfecting process takes place after you pass away? We, we Catholics give it a name. We call it purgatory. What do you guys call it? <laughs> and he stopped for a second, and he said, well, we don't have a name for it. And I said, but you do believe that a final purging, a final being made perfect, the final rush of your holy processing takes place either in this life or after death. And he said, oh, yeah, sure. And I go, well, maybe we believe the same thing. It's just you guys don't have a name for it, and we do. And yeah. the phone kind of had a long pause. And he said, well, you know, that's a really good point. So he started to, to, to understand that, well, yeah, no one clean thing can enter heaven, so there's got to be a final rush of sanctifying uh, perfection in our souls prior to death or after death, and we just call it purgatory. Yeah. Yeah, you know, that squares perfectly with my own experience. That I found that uh, lots of Protestants, in fact, I would think every Protestant I've ever met, has some uh, understanding of purgatory, you know, some understanding of final sanctification. Uh, the only difference is they don't call it that. You know, it, it <laughs> it's kind of, it's there, but they don't really identify it. And, uh, yeah, that squares perfectly with how I, I, I have uh, talked with others. Yeah, and I just, I was able to explain to uh, the friend of mine that, you know, we, we try and break things down and understand, um, you know, how things happen. And that's why we, we, we get a little bit more intricate in, in the theology in the Catholic Church, whereas in the, in the evangelical church, uh, not to downplay it, but it, it doesn't, it's, it's a little bit less uh, systematic. Yeah, yeah. So sometimes it's good just to tease it out, you know, and like you did, you know, ask questions and uh, get them to realize, yeah, of course, we believe that there's this, uh, ultimately in heaven we'll be perfectly sanctified, not just called holy, but actually be holy. And that's something that has to happen. Exactly. And I, I went on to explain to him that purgatory exists because of the finished work of Christ. Mm -hmm. In other words, purgatory is not an additional thing because Jesus didn't accomplish it all on the cross, so we need some extracurricular activity because Jesus didn't fulfill everything. No. Rather, the fact that Jesus died on the cross uh, forgives us of all of our sin. And yet, through life, we may or we may not become fully purified in this life. So God, in his loving providence, provides post-mortem, if necessary, a final process that the righteousness of Christ that he obtained on the cross can be applied to us so that we will be made perfect and therefore be able to enter heaven and be with him forever. Very good. Well, we're talking with Stephen Fiskowski about purgatory. Stay tuned, everyone. This is Terry Barber inviting you, all the men, to a men's conference June 15th at the Sacred Heart Chapel. This is going to be a day where we're going to talk about true masculinity. You know, there's a problem in the Catholic Church today. We have very few men who love the Catholic faith. And I know a lot of the wives that I'm listening to right now are saying, I want my husband to be on fire for the faith. Send him to the men's conference. Your son, send him to the men's conference by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org or call 877-526-2151. That's June 15th. When your husband comes back from this conference or your son, they're going to have a different view about their Catholic faith because they're going to meet three men who love Jesus and his bride, the church, and are going to instill in them a love for Christ and his church, the Eucharist, Our Lady. Bring them to virginmostpowerfulradio.org. Sign up there or call 877-526-2151. Full sheen ahead. It is only because of your continued prayers and generous donations that Virgin Most Powerful Radio can broadcast live each weekday. We count on your spiritual and financial support 
because you understand the urgent need for Catholic programming that shares the gospel with clarity and charity, but without compromise. Please prayerfully consider becoming a monthly donor. You can set it up with the touch of a button on our website, catholicrc.org. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. This is Jesse Romero. You're listening to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And welcome back, everybody. We're talking about purgatory with uh, Revert, Stephen Piskorowski, and uh, we just got done uh, explaining how, uh, in a sense, uh, Protestants already have a kind of working understanding of purgatory, although they, they, they probably wouldn't call it. And, uh, Stephen, I say we have a call from Bobby from Michigan. Bobby, welcome to Hands-On Apologetic. What's your question? Hey, Steve and Gary. It's Bobby from Michigan. Hi, Bobby. <laughs> yeah, I was. I had a question for you. Um, it says in the book of Job, uh, verses 1, 6 through 12, that Satan entered into heaven and presented himself among the sons of God. And then it says in Revelation that no unclean thing can enter into heaven. So how do you reconcile those two verses? Okay. Well, I you would, can't be more I unclean would, than Satan. And that's right. Yeah, I, I, I would say that it doesn't necessarily mean that Satan actually entered into heaven. Um, in some way, Satan could have requested an audience with God, and God, in a sense, could have met him halfway to hear what he, he was going to present to him. So it doesn't necessarily mean that, uh, that Satan did uh, go directly or have the ability to go directly to heaven to talk to God. So, you know, I think there's a little bit of a, you know, a, a potential interpretation there on that. Yeah. Uh, follow yeah, up, Bobby? Kind of like a literary... Uh... And Gary, could I, could I ask you a, a, a quick question? Sure. Okay. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, do you believe that... Uh... I mean, would somebody need to be purified in purgatory if they enjoy the movie Batman v. Superman, Dawn of Justice? Uh, you're such a bad person, Bobby. By the way, folks, in case you don't know who the caller is, <laughs> uh, we've had him on the show a couple of times. It's Bobby Hesley, and that seems to be like a running joke between us. Uh, Bobby, I don't know if you could be saved watching that movie, so that's my short <laughs> answer for you. <laughs> He's a repeat offender. Love you guys. <laughs> All right. I just wanted to hear your guys' take on that because that that was a verse I would always think about, like a, a counter verse, like no unclean thing. Well, Satan entered. I always kind of thought it was more of like a literary device that the author used to just kind of make the story more interesting, uh, to kind of like form it like a debate between God and the devil. It just kind of made it more engaging. But uh, yeah, what, what's your take on that, Gary? Uh, yeah, I, I would think so. I mean, it's using some, it has to convey this idea of that there's this uh, dialogue between God and Satan. So, yeah, I think it would be more of a literary yeah. device, um, you know, uh, because, you know, Satan is the accuser and he can only do things by the permissive will of God. So there has to be some line of communication. Um, but, uh, yeah, okay, that's the best I could do. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just okay. had to call in and, uh, geek out with you guys a little bit over a hypothetical all right well thanks for <laughs> great thanks job. for your question especially the batman question we appreciate it <laughs> <laughs> all right. bless, Bye. thank you yeah thanks for calling um well steven uh i guess getting things back on track um <laughs> point two uh of your former self you you said uh purgatory can exist because basically you're saved by faith alone and mm -hmm. uh, so there's no need for purgatory. Yeah, how would you answer your former self on that one? Yeah, again, it, it doesn't fit in the idea of, of being saved by faith alone or sola fide, as Luther uh, um, made, it, made it out. 
Um, the point is we're not saved by faith alone. So since we're not saved by faith alone, that argument is really, it's like cutting off the branch that you're sitting on while you're sitting on it. You know, it, it doesn't make, right. it, it doesn't fit. So that objection, number two, is, is already presupposing that sola fide, or sola fide makes sense and is accurate. Well, it isn't. So that, that argument really kind of goes out the window. Um, one of the other arguments I did have, though, is, um, well, one was the word purgatory is not found in the Bible. Therefore, it's unbiblical. Yeah. You know, that was one that I, that I because I was a sola scriptura guy, and I, I felt that everything needed to be explained clearly in the Bible, or at least alluded to. And I just right. didn't see the Bible verses that would, that would support purgatory, although there's a number of them, actually. Um, I didn't see them at the time, so I thought, well, since it's not in the Bible, it must not be true. Yeah. But we find this to be erroneous because we would all agree on the doctrine of the Trinity, and yet the word Trinity is not in the Bible. Yeah. Um, there's a number of things that we believe, you know, uh, uh, that aren't in the text of Scripture, uh, but we as Catholics don't go by the Bible alone. We go by uh, sacred tradition and the sacred Scriptures um, uh, together that make up the full deposit of faith. We don't, we don't uh, truncate it down to just the written Scriptures. So really, that argument doesn't hold up either. Yeah, that's true. In fact, uh, you know, in addition to what you said, is also, you know, the Bible may not have stipulated, you know, uh, defining purgatory simply because it was already a working idea. It didn't really need to be brought up explicitly. It could just assume mm -hmm. that its readers already understood it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, one of the other objections I had was Catholics teach that if you're not bad enough to go to hell, but not good enough to heaven, you end up in purgatory. Kind of like the, the backup prize. You know, it's yeah, almost right. like, a, it's, it's like a nasty participation trophy um, <laughs> that, that Christians get. Not good enough for heaven, not bad enough for hell, so you just end up in purgatory. But again, that's a misunderstanding of what purgatory is. Yeah. There will be a time. Uh, where purgatory ceases to exist, because its purpose will cease to exist. Once the last soul leaves purgatory, the last person is born, the last person dies, the last soul leaves purgatory, purgatory will at that point no longer have a purpose. There will be nowhere, no one else to have fully purified. Everyone will either be in heaven or in hell, and purgatory will cease to exist. And that's, that's the purpose for it. It's a place of final purging. It's not an eternal place where you get the backup prize. Now, as a Protestant, again, if you believe that you're saved and there's no reason for any full purification of the soul to take place, either in this life or after, again, this doesn't make sense. What we're talking about just doesn't make sense. It only makes sense in a Catholic um, uh, point of view, um, so yeah, I mean that that was that was one of the other one of the other object, objections that I had. Yeah, it's also a misunderstanding about how we view salvation. You know that you have to. There's a level where you have to be good enough to earn salvation, and you know if you don't reach that level, boy, if you just did a couple more good works, you could have been in heaven, but you didn't, so you're now in hell. Mm -hmm. You know that's all mm -hmm. for sure too. You know, yeah. It, it, it absolutely is. And, you know, there's so many scriptural verses that allude um, to, uh, to the doctrine of purgatory. My favorite one is in 2 Maccabees, uh, okay. 12, 43 to 45. And um, if I could just quote it, starting in verse 43, he also took up a collection man by man to the amount of 2,000 drachmas of silver and sent it to Jerusalem to provide for a sin offering. In doing this, he acted very well and honorably, taking account of the resurrection. For if he were not expecting that those who had fallen would rise, it would have been superfluous and foolish to pray for the dead. But if he was looking forward to the splendid reward that is laid up for those who fall asleep in godliness, it was a holy and pious thought. Therefore, he made atonement for the dead so that they may be delivered from their sin. So what we're seeing here in Maccabees is proof positive that there's a benefit for those who have passed on before us when we pray for them, or we have Mass said for them, 
or we do pious works and ask the Lord to apply those graces to the person who passed uh, away, uh, apply it to their soul in a sense. So the question then becomes, well, good heavens, if there's only heaven and hell, and people in heaven don't need prayers, as a matter of fact, we ask them to pray for us. If prayers can't help people in heaven because they're already there, and prayers don't help people in hell because there's no hope for them, what is going on here in Second Maccabees? Well, it seems to indicate that there is some intermediate state for those who are on their way to heaven, but just not there yet, not fully purified yet. And this is where prayers and good works can benefit the souls in purgatory who are guaranteed heaven, but not just yet. Yeah, yeah, very good. Well, we only have a couple of minutes, but let me uh, let me ask you, you know, as an evangelical, now, uh, Second Maccabees wouldn't be part of your Old Testament. You know, it'd probably be in the Apocrypha. Would you still give it weight? I would, and the reason I do is because that leads into an entirely different uh, conversation, yeah. who recognized which books belong in the canon of Scripture and which books do not. So it's a matter of authority. So that ultimately gets me to the, to the topic that, that I think really has the most evidence for, for why I became Catholic. It was the Catholic bishops who had the authority to recognize which books would be considered inspired Scripture and which ones weren't. So it prompts that conversation. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I mean, you know, there's there's a number of there's another of uh, of, of other uh, verses in the scripture. Uh, for instance, First Corinthians three thirteen sixteen, where it talks about. Well, I'll just quote it if I have time. Do I have time? Yeah, yeah, about a minute. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. First Corinthians three thirteen. The work of each builder will become visible, for the day will disclose it. Because it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test which sort of work each has done. If what has been built on the foundation survives, the builder will receive a reward. If the work is burned up, the builder will suffer loss. The builder will be saved, but only as through fire. So what we're seeing here is an allusion to the doctrine of purgatory in, in, in Corinthians. Okay. Where it yeah. talks about the builder will be saved, but only as through fire. So it's not his works that are just being uh, burnt up or you know being purged, uh, but the builder himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Interesting. Yeah, and he will suffer loss. So it, and he will know, suffer it, loss. Th- there's some sort of suffering uh, involved with that. Yeah, very good. Right. Well. Uh, well, uh, let's see. On the other side of the break, actually, uh, I'm curious how you would read that passage back when you were evangelical. How did you make sense of it? Uh, but we're coming up to the break. We are talking with Master Apologist Stephen Piskorowski about purgatory. And uh, as always, you can join the conversation, 888-526-2151. Listen to Hands-On Apologetics. Stay tuned, everyone. This is Terry Barber inviting you, all the men, to a men's conference June 15th at the Sacred Heart Chapel. This is going to be a day where we're going to talk about true masculinity. You know, there's a problem in the Catholic Church today. We have very few men who love the Catholic faith. And I know a lot of the wives that I'm listening to right now are saying, I want my husband to be on fire for the faith. Send him to the men's conference. Your son, send him to the men's conference by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org or call 877-526-2151. That's June 15th. When your husband comes back from this conference or your son, they're going to have a different view about their Catholic faith because they're going to meet three men who love Jesus and his bride, the church, and are going to instill in them a love for Christ and his church, the Eucharist, Our Lady. Bring them to virginmostpowerfulradio.org. Sign up there or call 877-526-2151. Full sheen ahead. 
It is only because of your continued prayers and generous donations that Virgin Most Powerful Radio can broadcast live each weekday. We count on your spiritual and financial support because you understand the urgent need for Catholic programming that shares the gospel with clarity and charity, but without compromise. Please prayerfully consider becoming a monthly donor. You can set it up with the touch of a button on our website, catholicrc.org. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. And welcome back, everybody. How would an evangelical possibly uh, come to find that purgatory is biblical? Well, we're talking with Master Apologist Stephen Piskorowski uh, about his journey to faith and specifically about you know, how he came to uh, wrestle with and eventually accept the idea of purgatory. And Stephen, you mentioned 1 Corinthians 3 uh, before the break about how mm -hmm. uh, someone will suffer, you know, his, his works will be tried by fire and the inferior works will be burned up and he'll suffer loss, but he'll be saved as through fire. I was just curious, you know, if you can remember as an evangelical when you're looking at that, how, how did you make sense of it? Yeah, I remember exactly how I how I justified it. I I looked at this verse or these verses of scripture as an example of the rewards that we would be receiving or not be receiving uh, at the final judgment. In other words, how many jewels or how many lack of jewels would be in my crown that the Lord would give me at the end of time? Um, and I and I based it on verse fourteen. If what has been built on the foundation survives, a builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer loss. So I kind of looked at it like the Lord saying, well, here's Stephen, I love you very much, and you're going to heaven, you're, 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 you're ready to come in, but this was my original plan for you, um, and, you know, these are the things that you did, and some of these things are burnt up because they're worthless, but this is what, it, this is what your crown would have looked like, but come on into heaven, this is what your crown does look like. Um, but that's really not what the, 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 the Scripture really indicates, because if you, if you look at the last verse, it says, the builder, the builder will be saved. It's not talking about reward. It's not talking about works at that point. That's a part of it. But he very clearly says, the builder will be saved, but only as through fire. Mm -hmm. And that really puts a spin on the whole context of the of the entire uh, uh two verses because it's not talking about works at the end it's talking about the builder or the, you know, the builder will be saved but only as through fire so there's a difference there okay yeah very good yeah uh, that I, I could see where uh that would that would lead to both positions you know where a reward mm -hmm. but then you know he's he's saved as through fire uh were there any other it, verses that uh pushed you along? Yeah, just one comment on that. You know, in okay. Catholic theology, we, 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 would, we would hold to the both-and position instead of the, 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 the position that I used to hold as evangelical Protestant, which was either-or. It's either this or that. Well, not necessarily. It's both-and, and in this case is a good example of it, that uh, it, it is both-and. It's both his works uh, and um, you know the actual person, the actual builder, being saved through fire. So, um, yeah, that's good. Yeah, in terms of a couple other um, objections that I may have had. Yeah, let's move on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, one of them was you Catholics believe in three eternal places of existence after this life: heaven, hell, and purgatory. I think we've exhausted that one pretty, pretty much. Um, right. Uh, Catholics can earn salvation for dead people. 
uh-huh. through the doctrine of indulgences. And I know we don't have a lot of time to go to go into that, but I kind of thought to myself, at the time I was an evangelical Protestant, well, good heavens, you know, now we're going to earn salvation for people who died so that uh, they cannot go to hell and rather go to heaven. So it's yeah. almost like... <laughs> You know, everybody would get a, a, a chance at going to heaven then after they died. As long as you had a, a a good group here on earth doing good works for you, everybody will get in. Yeah, right. Um, now, you know, our listeners that's, might that's not remember, true. but you did a counter cult work within the evangelical community you're with. And so this probably sounded like uh, baptism for the dead, you know, like Mormons. You yeah. Know, you could yeah. do some your work on earth to get them into a, like a higher exaltation in the afterlife. I imagine that probably plugged in there somewhere. Yeah, it 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 did, and that's that's not at all what this is. Um, yeah. Once we die, we undergo what's called uh, the particular judgment, and you find out your your eternal destiny, and it's sealed. For those that are uh, going to hell, they know that they're going to hell, and there's no hope. For those that are going to heaven, know they're going to heaven, and there's total hope. But there might be a pit stop in purgatory to receive your final purification, being 100% purified um, and entering into the kingdom of God. And if you're in purgatory, you're already going to heaven. So this isn't a matter of trying to reverse the process of so-and-so died, I'm going to pray for them because they're on their way to hell possibly, and I'm going to reverse that. We're going to reverse the trend. No. Um, Prayers for those in purgatory are already going to heaven. It's just a matter of how long they'll be detained there as far as we measure space and time. And purgatory is more of a process than it is yeah. a place. Yeah, that's a very good point. It's it, it's just merely our, our sanctification uh, before we enter heaven. It's not really a destination, right? Right, and I think of I think of that commercial on TV with the with the marine with that sword, and when you mm-hmm. see it at first, it's a sword, it's metal, it's got all these imperfections, and it's on an anvil, and it's red hot, and it's being beaten, and it's it's being conformed into shape. And by the end of the commercial, when he says "Be all you can be," he flips that sword up that sword up on his shoulder, and it's polished, and it's perfect, and it's ready for action. That's kind of the way that I look at purgatory, minus the the mallet beating us. <laughs> <laughs> it's a final rush of sanctification. As a matter of fact, it was explained to me, you know, imagine, imagine Gary, you're getting married, and I come to the wedding, and everybody in the wedding feast is, is, is getting ready to, uh, to celebrate your marriage. And everyone's dressed up in tuxedos and got on, all the women have gowns, and, and it's just an immaculate presentation. And I walk in from the outside, and I'm wearing jeans, and I smell, and I haven't combed my hair, and you know, I've got, you know, I'm not, I'm not particularly ready. Although I'm invited, I'm really not ready. And you say to me, Stephen, you know what? I'm glad you're here, but we've got to get you cleaned up. We're going to get you a shower. We're going to comb your hair. We're going to put a tuxedo on you. And then you're going to come and join in the feast with us because you're supposed to be here. You're just not quite ready yet. And as a matter of fact, we're going to wait. We're not even going to start. We're going to wait for you. But we have to get you ready to enter into the uh, into the into the supper. Well, this is really one of the examples that we see in the book of Revelation with the wedding uh, supper of the Lamb. Mm-hmm. And if we put that into perspective, you know, in terms here on space and time, uh, and, you, and you think about a wedding feast, um, people dress up, people comb their hair, they take a shower, they're ready. And if you show up and you're not that way. You know, the groom might say, "Hey, let's get you ready before you enter into the into the wedding feast." So that might be a way to help to under, understand it a little bit. Yeah, right. And you know, I love that analogy because, uh, like I said, one of the even Catholics have this terrible vision of purgatory, kind of like God getting back at us because we've had too much fun in this life or something weird like that. But purgatory is actually an incredible expression of God's mercy. You know. Mm-hmm. That he doesn't mm-hmm. he doesn't expect absolute perfection from us in this life. He realizes that you know even the just man falls seven times and gets up, right? Mm-hmm. But uh, mm-hmm. you know in his mercy he purifies us. 
And even moreover, it's it's even more of a sign of God's mercy because He provides for us because He knows that we're not going to live up to the standard. So He provides post mortem after our death uh, the opportunity to receive our final rush of sanctification, so that we can be with Him where He is and see Him face to face. So God, in His mercy, provided for us. So purgatory is a beautiful. Uh, teaching, not not a dreary one. I mean, you know, I personally believe, I, you know, even talking about this, I'm probably going to be the guy who turns the lights out and ends up sweeping the floors. I'll be the last one there. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but for all those in purgatory, although they're they're detained, undergoing their final rush of sanctification, it's kind of sad because they want to be with God. Um, but on the other hand, they have an immense amount of hope that it's coming. I'm almost ready. And uh, yeah. that's the exact opposite of the experience that the souls in hell have, where there is yes. no hope and no expectation. Yes. Yeah, that was going to be my next question about, you know, uh, because usually the, the symbol of uh, fire, you know, uh, purging fire is used for purgatory and how that differs from hell. But you're right, though, because uh, everyone in purgatory will infallibly end up in heaven. So Absolutely. Absolutely great hope because it's going to be realized where in hell it's the opposite exactly and you know god's love is often referred to in the holy scriptures as a consuming fire mm. um and you know uh so the closer that you get to god the, the 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 more that the spotlight shines on your imperfections and um you know uh so uh, being made fully purified is not only a prerequisite but we're going to actually want that, because we're going to want to be as close to God as we can in full union with Him. And if there's any imperfections, that's a hindrance to us uh, yeah. having full union with Him uh, when we're in heaven. Right. Yeah, we're not going to be in heaven wishing we were doing something else. You know? <laughs> we're, right. No, we're going to be totally oriented towards God. Absolutely, we will. All right. Well, hey... Uh, Great program, Stephen. I appreciate you coming on the show and, and as always, you know, shining some light on purgatory for us. Absolutely. I'm so glad that you asked me to be on and love to come back. Oh, absolutely. Yep, you will be on the roster. Although I, I can't say, you know, Bobby Hesley will be on the roster. Apparently, you know, this is the show where apologists are listening and calling in and I might have him back as a guest, but maybe not as a caller. I don't <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe I'll call in on that show with a question. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, maybe that's it. Could be his own little you know version of purgatory here on the show. Absolutely. All right. Offer uh, offer up the sufferings for uh, for others. There you go. Well, thank you, Stephen. I appreciate it. God bless you, Gary. Thanks for having me on. All right. That was Stephen Piskorowski, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, yeah, great discussion. Stephen's been a longtime friend. I, I knew him shortly after his reversion back to the faith and. Uh, just the storehouse of knowledge. So I hope you enjoyed uh, our discussion on purgatory. Like I said, we got a great week in store for you today, uh, you know, for this week, I should say, not today. Um, tomorrow, uh, it'll be the best of show. I, I have a speaking engagement here in Detroit. Uh, Wednesday, Carlo Broussard joins us, talk about suffering. And uh, Thursday, we're going to talk to YouTuber Mathema about um, and misunderstandings about arguments for the existence of God. And then finally, Friday, we're going to have Dr. Brian Bradford back in the dojo talk about the Quran and Jesus. going to be a great week in store for us. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Coming up next, High Impact Catholic Talk with the Terry and Jesse Show, the show that started it all here on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And please, you know, keep us in your prayers. Uh, share us, like us on social media. We appreciate Let other people know about the programs here. And also, thank you so much for your generous donations. As always, it's time for me to turn off the lights here at the Midwest Command Center and shut down the dojo. And, uh, you know, we must decrease and the Terry and Jesse show must increase. So stay tuned for a high-impact talk radio. It's great. It's great to talk to you today. Thank you so much for listening. Bye-bye.